Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The guest has arrived. May I request you all to uh, switch off your mobile phones or put that on silent mode. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you all for today's event. We have gathered here for a talk by Her Excellency Ambassador Monica Juma, DPhil, CBS Cabinet Secretary, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Republic of Kenya. She would speak on the topic, how Africa-India relations fit in a shifting world order. And the chair really? and the uh, <laughs> session will be chaired by Ambassador Rajiv K. Bhatia, former High Commissioner of India to Kenya. On behalf of the Indian Council of World Affairs, I would like to extend my warm welcome to Honorable Speaker, Her Excellency Ambassador Dr. Monica Juma. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to brief you all about uh, today's program. We have in the chair for this session, as I earlier mentioned, Ambassador Rajiv K. Bhatia. We shall start the session with a welcome remark by DG ICWA, Ambassador TCA Raghavan, which will be followed by a brief remark by the chair and then the most awaited lecture of Her Excellency Dr. Juma. After that, we shall have a brief question and answer session. Now I request DGICWA to kindly give his welcome remark and hand over the proceedings to Ambassador Rajiv K. Bhatia. Thank you. Your Excellency Dr. Monica K. Juma, Cabinet Secretary, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Republic of Kenya, Ambassador Rajiv Bhatia, former High Commissioner to Kenya, and if I may say, former Director General, Indian Council of World Affairs, and uh, His Excellency Willie K. Bett, High Commissioner of Kenya, Your Excellencies, members of the Diplomatic Corps, distinguished guests, dear friends. Uh, may I say that how very delighted we are on behalf of the Council to have with us uh, Dr. Monica Juma. Uh, Madam Secretary, you have a, had a long, long service in government with a career that spans across a very wide range of posts and responsibilities, both within the country and internationally. You also have extremely strong academic uh, credentials. And, uh, uh, and for that, I think this particular platform of the Indian Council of World Affairs is a wonderful occasion for us to hear about how India-Africa relations fit in a shifting world order. I'm very grateful to my colleague, Ambassador Bhatia, for chairing this session uh, today. As you know, ladies and gentlemen, Ambassador Bhatia was Director General of the Council, but he has, over the years, uh, and particularly, if I may say, since his retirement, emerged as a major public intellectual and mm -hmm. commentator on mm -hmm. foreign policy. And the fact that he was High Commissioner, Indian High Commissioner in Kenya not so long ago, made him right person, the right person to chair this uh, session. Madam Secretary, as I explained to you, the Council was set up in 1943, some years before our independence, as an effort to develop an independent Indian perspective on world affairs. Uh, we value greatly all the opportunities we have to, uh, to have with us in our midst uh, senior public figures and statespersons from the African continent. It gives us an opportunity to hear directly from them an African perspective, an African voice on how the world order is emerging, how it is evolving. I do not need to amplify to this audience how quickly Arch the architecture of the world is changing and evolving. Your visit here, madam, uh, is also in the wake of a growing international recognition that uh, the factor of terrorism, something which we have lived in in India for over a quarter of a century now, is something which will continue to be a major factor and a major negative force in this emerging mm. architecture. Mm. Uh, for all these reasons, but especially to hear a Kenyan perspective on Africa-India relations, and also, of course, your own perspectives on India-Kenya relations, because your visit here is in the context of a 
very important joint commission meeting. Uh, I do feel greatly privileged that you were able to find the time to visit the council and address it uh, today. With these remarks, may I request Ambassador Rajiv Bhatia to kindly conduct the rest of this afternoon's proceedings. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Director General, Madam Cabinet Secretary, our two High Commissioners, distinguished participants, and my young friends from ICWA, some old, some new. <laughs> it's wonderful to be uh, here uh, on uh, the Director General's invitation, but I'm particularly delighted that um, the Cabinet Secretary, whom we used to call the Foreign Minister a few years back, is here uh, from the friendly country, Kenya. Uh, as you heard, she has done it all. She has been a very experienced civil servant, having handled uh, some of the key ministries of that country, Interior Ministry, Defense Ministry, Foreign Affairs, and now she is an important political leader in her own right. But before that, she has had extensive diplomatic experience, both bilateral and multilateral. And of course, uh, she is an author diplomat. She is a doctorate from Oxford. And uh, so obviously, it's going to be a great pleasure and privilege to listen to her. I wish to say that the world has changed a great deal since the time I served in uh, Kenya. Uh, 20 years back, that was the time when terrorism came knocking on the doors of Kenya itself. Mm -hmm. I was there when uh, the uh, uh, pre-run for the New York was done in Nairobi mm -hmm. uh, on the American embassy, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which led to very serious injuries to the American ambassador and to the mm -hmm. trade minister uh, of the time. That was also the time which was uh, the unipolar moment for America in the world. Also the time when India did the nuclear tests and whatever else followed. So in a way at the turn of the century, it was a different world. It is not my nostalgia, but my purpose is to bring as to how today, uh, you know, the power has truly shifted from those who used to wield power mm. to those who actually uh, were not used to dealing uh, with power. Uh, they are the ones who are now wielding the power. Now the shift, is it from uh, west to east? Or can we say more accurately, it is from west and north to east and south? Because I think it would be more sensitive to say that uh, because it's more inclusive of Africa. Uh, and I think this is the point I want to make in the presence of the minister. I also want to say <clears throat> that very often scholars in Asia, you know, like a machine keep talking about 21st century as the Asian century. Mm. But the more sensitive ones, more respectful of Africa, they still talk about 21st century as the Afro-Asian century. Because obviously, without involving one billion plus people of Africa, I don't see how 21st century can be the century of just one part of the world. Madam Minister, as you know, uh, Western scholars talk a lot about the second scramble for Africa today. Again, a very disrespectful way to refer to Africa. Africa is no longer an object of international politics. It is a subject. It is a proactive actor in international affairs. We simply have to wake up and see how Africa is changing day by day uh, in front of our own eyes in terms of heading towards peace, democracy, economic development, and all those visionary ideas which are coming out of the African leadership, and I'm sure about which uh, Madam Minister would be making uh, some references. But above all, I think we truly need to know from you 
as to how you see the world is changing and what is uh, Africa's role in, in that changing world. We are happy that Africa is taking a bigger role, but what prevents Africa from taking an even bigger role uh, in, in the world? Does Africa, particularly Eastern Africa, do you need to have your own Act East policy to look more towards Asia? I'm so happy that you are here, not merely visiting India, but also I understand Sri Lanka and Bangladesh. So in a way, this is obviously heralding a very interesting thing where Kenyan foreign minister comes and goes all the way to South Asia and eventually to Southeast Asia as well. I uh, very much uh, express my uh, deep appreciation and my happiness on your presence here today. And we are looking forward to your lecture, Madam, and therefore may I now invite you to address us. Thank you. Thank you. I'll carry this since you have asked me some questions. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> Where I come from, we greet. And if you don't answer me, I don't continue until I'm sure we are all well. So thank you very much. Dr. Raghavan, DG of the Indian Council of World Affairs, Ambassador Rajiv Bhatia, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. May I begin by expressing the great honor I feel for this rare opportunity to share an afternoon with this distinguished audience. I wish to thank everyone for the kind gesture of gracing this event. And I want to begin by saying how pleased I am to be part of the history that the World Council, the Indian Council of World Affairs represents. A little earlier on, I was being told about the founder of this great place, who is a man that is distinguished, Nehru, a man that we look to a man that inspires not just diplomacy, but the conduct of politics and public affairs. So I'm really delighted to be part, to have an opportunity to have a little bit of that spirit. Hopefully it can come back with me uh, as I return back home. I also want to uh, give a warning before I start, and this is because I want to find somebody to blame for the inadequacies that I have today. I arrived only last night, and my staff have not let me rest. So if I don't make sense, you know who to blame. It will be my team led by the High Commissioner. But it is also true that I have not had a chance to do an intellectual reflection on a lot of the things I will be saying. A lot of it will really be coming from some of the policy reflections that we grapple with every day. You know, we are waking up to shifts and movements that are happening. And as uh, Ambassador Bhatia will tell you, and those of, of you that are in the policy world, the changes are happening so quickly that sometimes you don't have time to reflect from an intellectual point of view. So I shall not pretend in any way that I will be giving you some intellectual groundbreaking theories today. Rather, I shall be sharing with you some of the things that we are grappling with from where I sit in terms of some of the insights on the trajectory of Africa-India ties in a global world that is very fast shifting, as was indicated by Ambassador Bhatia. And therefore, in order to completely not be able to be held accountable, what I intend to do is really to provoke us. Because I want, I want some discussion, I, and I want some reflections out of here to just test the thinking that we are having from across the other side of the Indian Ocean. So I hope that I can use about four issues, four points to, to, to provoke us. And what I want to do then is really to place the context within which I read the Africa, India, and the world today. And then secondly, to look at how we can recast this relationship in what I think is a mold in a very fluid geopolitical world today. So I want to speak about four things. The first one is the geopolitics, how we see the geopolitics shifting, what is shifting in, in today's geopolitics. Then I want to speak to the whole question of global governance 
and what I call the democratic recession. Thirdly, I want to talk about cooperation in the Indian Ocean realm, because I think this is a big area that requires some reflection. And finally, I want to talk about the risks and maybe opportunities that are associated with what we are calling the fourth industrial revolution. And I hope that I can telescope this within the vision of Africa as we move, we push towards the continental free trade area. So what about the shifting geopolitics? As Ambassador Bhatia has alluded, I think we are witnessing very uh, swift unraveling of the post-World War II global order. We are having uh, profound shifts in the balance of the geopolitical power. We are having unprecedented leaps in technology. You know, this morning as I was talking to the African group of ambassadors, or I don't know, the business community earlier on, I was telling them how in Kenya today, um, it's very difficult to evade my grandmother's demands. You know, she calls and says, I am at the shop. Can you please transfer some money to me now? <laughs> you know, and, and she doesn't expect you to say you don't have it. So she's standing there, and she's able to use the digital platform to reach me and to demand the right, which is her money, uh, whether I have it or not. So it, that is where we are, that grandmothers can actually interact with the 21st century technology without hesitation. This is, this is where we are. Might look obvious today, was not so obvious 20 years ago. Now, these changes are not fleeting. I don't think they are. I don't think they are ephemeral. And we really do not know how long it will take for the world to settle down, to have what we might have been used to in terms of a stable trajectory. So for Africa and our external environment, as this environment continues to be fluid, as it continues to be vague, as it continues to be uncomfortable, the question is, do we remain disinterested? How do we engage with an environment that is so unsettled? And I think this is an important question, especially in diplomacy, where we are used to values and norms and practices and traditions, you know, where things are in rules and procedures. I think we are finding it very difficult to follow rules and procedures anymore uh, as we knew them. So there is an increasing consensus that the power dynamics of our time has shifted. In fact, at the multilateral level, we are saying there is a shift from cooperation, cooperative diplomacy and engagement to strategic rivalry and competition. We are now seeing, in fact, more claims for new architectures that reject multilateral action, reject multilateral frameworks, and they favor the narrow nationalism, narrow parochialism, narrow individualism, individual nation states. Now, we know, of course, that even in the past, we were always faced with some shifts. But I think what compounds today's context is also a range of other challenges that are becoming more prevalent and real. Climate change, for example. Competition for scarce resources. In some cases, state fragility, we still experience this. And all these add layers upon layers that create greater uncertainty. This state of affairs, of course, has implications for global trade. It has implications for migration. Europe thinks this is the biggest thing. But I think it also has real implications for governance, for demographics, for peace and security, and for the general stability of the world as we know it, uh, and as promised by the post-Cold War era. In fact, and I recall about a week and a half ago, attending the Munich conference, and I was struck by the opening statement of the chair of the Munich conference, whose statement was titled, Who Will Pick Up the Pieces? Kind of indicative of where we are. Who will pick up the pieces? The pieces are falling apart, but who will pick it up? For me, this was quite striking because many times in the discussions on global order, there has always been those that are expected to pick up the pieces, those that are expected to lead in reconstructing the world. Okay? But in this case, there was almost a dialogue of, of, of confusion. You know, The place of America, everybody was saying, so since America is going this way, what do we do? Will Europe be able to forestall the effects of America. 
Will we have a China that behaves in a way to be a responsible leader? Does Africa have a space in these discussions of the new world order? So clearly something is happening that is of concern and that tells us we are in a new space. Now, I think the most important thing is that this situation, as we evolve through this situation, we are going to come out at the end of it with new formations. The question then becomes, what set of orders, what set of formations are going to emerge? And what will be the place of Africa and India, or in this case specifically, of Kenya and India as we emerge from this world of flux? Will we play a greater role in shaping this new world order? Are we going to be able to clarify its contours? Are we going to be able to push its limits? And if we push this limit, will this be to our advantage or will this marginalize us? I think these are the big questions and this is what is going to define the alignments that emerge from the current uh, world order. So these are the geopolitics, the, the geostrategic standing we are having we are shifting, and the question becomes, how can we become more relevant in those shifts so that we can shape it? The second contour that I want to speak to is the whole question on global governance and the democratic process. Since the end of the, the, the World War II, I think it is true to say that democracy was privileged or became the premier aspiration of the world. It became the system of norms and values that was most desired. So if you are democratic, then you are a better society, and so forth and so forth. And a lot of the theorization emerged around democracies being more peaceful, democracies not going to war, but democracies being better developed, democracies being more just, and so forth and so forth. So the whole world somewhat was engineered in a way that democracy was the preferred set of norms was the preferred set of tradition that countries aspired to, and your level of development, in fact, was defined by how democratic or not democratic that you were. But it is true today we couldn't, uh, we couldn't have this assessment standing. I think it is true to speak about a democratic recession globally. It is true to say that we are seeing a lot of pressure on democratization. And the most interesting thing is that the biggest pressure on democratization is coming from the democratic world, quote unquote. I think that is, that is the, the most interesting uh, phenomena we are facing. Now, over the years, and from an African perspective, we've been trying to strengthen our democratic credentials. Clearly, if you look at Kenya today, our constitution of 2010 is lauded as one of the most democratic constitutions in the world. You know, everybody pats our back, you know. Uh, we are congratulated for strengthening our democratic credentials, and we believe that we are in the path, in the right path in terms of the democratic project. This country has been, is, 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 uh, is hailed as the world democratic, the, the best democracy, the biggest democracy in the world. But as Africa struggles to entrench its democratic values, as we do in Kenya, as India is trying to entrench its democratic values, I think something is happening. Something is happening, and I think those that believe in the democratic project globally have to be very worried. Somehow, if we believe that these are the best values, I think they need champions <laughs> today. I think they need champions today. Can India, which is the world's largest democracy, be the vanguard for supporting the democratization project across the world? And we have seen this to the highest level. The whole assault on the rule-based international order including multilateralism, the assault on the WTO that we are actually witnessing. We are at the verge of the collapse of the WTO. We, we have been struggling with the UN reforms today. I think that is indicative 
of the democratic, the struggle of democracy in an era where we are seeing resistance uh, uh, of, of, of democracy. So what then, what are we to do? Is, is democracy still the valued system? If it is the valued system, then it seems to me we must find champions for the democratic project. Who are those champions? Are those champions going to be Africa? Are those champions going to have to emerge from the collaboration of Africa and India, which is, uh, as I've indicated, um, uh, fated as, as, as one of the exemplars of, of democracy? How can we then push back on initiatives that seem to be receding the democratic project? I think this is important because it goes to the organization of society and the question around relations between nations. It was only the democratic dispensation that provided for the equality of nations and rightful engagement at every forum, large or small, weak or strong. So in the absence of these norms and values, what does the international system of interaction look like? And I think I just want to pose that as, as we continue. If then we mean that we desire the rule-based international order, a system that upholds the right and sovereignty of all states, a system where the rule of law is important, a system where everyone benefits from such an orderly, stable global environment, then how are we going to sustain, how are we going to protect a system that is, in my view, under very serious assault? And it is under serious assault from the conventional protectors of democracy. What, what have we taken from the historical protector of democracy? And I think this is important, really, in the light of the numerous challenges that we face, particularly a challenge like climate change, which would require cooperative action beyond borders, uh, threats like transnational crime, threats like terrorism, which are happening across the borders and which are very difficult to define and to deal with within the confines of territorial systems as we know. Issues of cyberspace and cybercrime, issues of technological crimes and things like that. So how are we going to deal with this if we do not revert and protect the rule-based order that recognizes collective action, that recognizes the rule of law? Let me now then turn to the third issue which is a quite a specific issue in relation to the cooperation in the Indian Ocean. Now, India and Africa, or Kenya, are neighbors except for the Indian Ocean, you know. And maybe we did a number of things. It would not be a boundary way. Really. It would be a pathway for a lot of things, trade, commerce, movement of people, and so forth. But one of the things that has happened in the Indian Ocean Bridge, certainly in the last couple of years, is that we are witnessing this becoming a new sphere of influence and or competition. In fact, some of us think that it is becoming to generate a portfolio of risk that is going to be very difficult to manage if we don't pay attention to it. And what do I mean? We started with the threats of piracy, and you remember that led to a situation where the commerce on this street became so expensive to move because of insurance, because of the threat, because of all sorts of things. Transnational crimes, trafficking, drugs, human limits, terrorism, which was being referred to by Ambassador Matia. But I think the biggest challenge today is what we see as a growing desire to have influence and to have a footprint in the Indian Ocean. If you look at the Red Sea alone, we are talking about a fleet of not less than 10 different militaries in this very small place, very, very small. So everybody there, Americans, the Chinese, Japanese, French, um, who are who else is there? You know, everybody is there. And all of them armed to the teeth. We have Operation Atalanta with almost 60 fleet of ships. A very small place. In fact, we have not seen that level of militarization in this region, even during the Cold War era. 
We think this portends a huge threat, and it just depends on a little mistake, deliberate or otherwise, to really cause a huge, a huge challenge. But it is also being played out by a growing interest of the Middle East into the Horn and the Red Sea region. And this is playing out in a very, very dangerous way, where we have people colluding with one side or the other, you know, funding this or the other side, demonstrating almost machinistic behavior on the ground in the Horn of Africa. We think, again, this portends a huge portfolio of risk that can be taken advantage of even by elements such as uh, counter terrorists and their agents. And, and in Somalia, for example, today, we are not only having the al Shabaab, but you are beginning to see the footprint of ISIS, you know, and this is growing, even as we see the passage, people being given <coughs> passage out of Syria. Now, this doesn't, the fact that Yemen is in such a flux does not make it any easier. So we are in a situation that the outside interest and footprint is growing a huge portfolio of risk that we still do not know how to manage it. We do not know how to manage and reduce this risk. And I think here lies the challenge. Herein lies the challenge because these are laying over a, an environment that is ecologically very fragile. The entire the whole of Africa, very, very fragile, <laughs> environmentally very weak, cyclic drought, cyclic famine, cyclic shortages of food. So a volatile, a very, very volatile, geographically volatile region where migration and forced migration have become almost a common feature throughout. And so we think a combination of all these things make it very, very, very dangerous. What is even increasing this is the growing commercial interest in this region. After we have seen a number of uh, studies, seismic studies in this region, and now we're beginning to see big companies really portraying a big appetite to engage. Now, we all know, history has at least told us, that when commercial interests combine in unstable regions, it can create multiple challenges, including insecurity, competition, and even more. We have seen that in many parts, at least of the, of the continent. And so, this region, all this brings to my mind the question, what is the obligation and role of the countries that are neighbors in the Indian Ocean Rim? We have not paid attention to the Indian Ocean Rim, and I think the growing interest in this region means we must pay attention. What type of attention should that be? What type of cooperation then should we engage in so that we can reduce the risk and probably optimize the opportunities that are found here, whether it is in terms of the blue economy, whether it is in terms of exploiting this blue economy, whether it is in terms of enhancing trade and reducing the risk on the trade, uh, trade lines and, and things like that. Finally, I want to speak uh, to the question around the fourth industrial revolution. And, and I think just to, put, to, to add a point about the Indian Ocean and interest, the whole Belt and Road Initiative cuts through the Red Sea down here. So you're also having a growing Chinese interest on this. So what, what does that mean? What does it protect? And how do we then manage uh, these interests, uh, these opportunities, and these risks. Then finally, I want to speak to the threats and risks, even opportunities, that come with what we are calling the fourth industrial revolution. It is true we stand on the brink of a technological revolution that will fundamentally alter the manner in which we live, the way we work, and the way we relate to one another. The scale and the scope and, uh, and complexity of this transformation, I think, has never been experienced by humanity before. <coughs> One thing is clear, though, that the way we respond to this, who we involve in the global polity, from the private to the public sector, and I dare say, academia also and civil society, and in many ways the debate on the fourth industrial revolution 
is the fact that government is far behind and is being driven by the private sector because they are quite far ahead, whether it is in the research, in the development of the technology and things like that. I, I think for countries like ourselves on the continent who are struggling with the industrial takeoff, yeah, the fundamental question is, do we have an opportunity to leap from to the fourth industrial <coughs> What does that mean? What type of relationship do we have to forge to enable us to leap from, from where we are to the fourth industrial revolution? Um, and I think this is really important because of the breadth of the changes that are going to transform our entire systems of production, our management, and our governance. I have already spoken to the possibilities that have been brought, for example, by techno the technology that we use today. Now, these possibilities are going to be multiplied by the emerging technology breakthrough in artificial intelligence, in robotics, in the internet, in the auto autonomous vehicles, in the 3D printing, nanotechnology, mention it, so some of which have already begun to catch up with us. Biotechnology, you know, material science, energy storage, quantum computing, name it. Now, we all know that artificial intelligence is already with us. From self-driving cars, you have already seen those. Although some of us are very frightened when we see them in the pictures. You know, you know to drones, we have seen drones at work very close to ourselves. You know, if it is in the fight against, uh, uh, against uh, uh, terrorism. And you've seen what, what could be very impressive development. But, the question then becomes, how do we manage these technologies? Just imagine who could have access to these technologies and what they could use them for. Uh, technology, for example. One of our biggest worries in Kenya is the possibility of a bio a chemical attack. You know? But do we have frameworks and regulatory frameworks to manage this. How do we develop this ahead of the private sector going ahead of the public sector? I think it's something that we need to really think about. How, what type of engineers and designers and architects do we need to, to, to develop? To, what kind of curricula will get us ahead of what is taking place very, very, very quickly? So I think in the discussion on this digital revolution, we have to think about the opportunities, but we have to think about the management side of it. How do we regulate it in a way that it is not going to become a genie out of a bottle? And sometimes when I sit alone, I think this could be a real possibility. Uh, and when I see those Star Wars, and my children kind of force me to watch them for two minutes, because I'm so scared of looking at the whole thing, you're left with this sense of complete out of control, you know, and you're thinking, if this is possible to imagine, what is the reality if it were to happen in real life? How, how would we deal with it? Now, I bring this up because I think India is much ahead in terms of technological advancement and thinking and training. And what then, what are the cooperative frameworks do we need to put in place? In my mind, for example, the whole discussion around the common African free trade area, because of some factors, structural factors such as the deficit in our infrastructural development, the deficit in our connectivity, I think a lot of the promise of the continental free trade area is going to be on the digital platform. Is this then a place for cooperation between Africa and India so that we can transform technology in a way that helps us to realize the promise of the CRT? Is this the place to go? Is, is this... A, a, how do we manage the pace of the development in the technology, in the fourth revolution? Are we able to do that? Or is it going to define us uh, by the way it, it develops ahead of us? So I, I think these four issues, in my mind, just underscore the imperative of more cooperation, the imperative of more discussion between our scientists, between our knowledge producers, between our technological experts, so that we can have a hold of a world that does not spin out of our own control, even as it promises, it gives us a lot of promises of transforming our lives, of transforming our productive sectors, and of managing 
the, the body quality as we know it today. So with, with those few remarks, I will, I will stop here. I think the idea is really to shape the geopolitics. The idea is to reduce the vulnerability. And the idea is to grow the opportunities. And I think we cannot do this without working very intimately together. I thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Your Excellency, for that uh, very broad-ranging and insightful analysis of uh, the emerging realities of the world, the changes that are happening, and uh, in what fashion policymakers, thinkers, intellectuals in Africa, India, and elsewhere need to start reflecting on how to address them. You are any chair's delight because uh, uh, being a scholar yourself, you present things in such a structured form that uh, everything becomes crystal clear. And I think in terms of those four sections of your lecture, which I need not summarize immediately, the, the idea has come out very clearly of your thinking that uh, the world is uh, changing and changing very fast, not just in terms of uh, politics or foreign policy, but in regard to the interstate relationships and in various other uh, domains of society. And it is in that context, I think, this whole question of global governance that needs to be thought about. You spoke about uh, a fairly new word, democratic recession where you said, on the one hand, within national jurisdictions, democracy has gained very strong roots, and yet in the international field, uh, the challenges on how to make the institutions more democratic, uh, in fact, has become even more uh, pressing and uh, more fundamental. Uh, you spoke uh, with passion about the uh, Indian Ocean Rim or in the Indian Ocean region, how uh, this being the connection between you and us, between your part of the world and our part of the world. And yet, uh, the governance remains uh, well below uh, the, uh, you know, even the minimum required level that you need in order to tackle even the traditional and classical problems, let alone the new problems. And your fourth section, I think, uh, is music to the ears of many of us because we have been thinking, writing, talking about the fourth industrial revolution, often without understanding too much about it. But the fact is that, you know, those domains that you talked about, uh, robotics, 3D printing, nanotechnology, biotechnology, we all have broad idea, but how it is going to impact on our lives and on policy making, and even on the future of work, that remains the big question. Madam, as I invite uh, the audience to uh, frame uh, their questions and uh, I'm sure there will be quite a lot of questions. Let me uh, just to set the ball rolling ask you one question uh, and uh, thereafter it will be dear friends your turn. My question is uh, that all what you said which is so perceptive and so balanced could you kindly relate this to the vision 2063 of Africa, because I have no doubt that many of those things are being addressed uh, within Africa uh, in various quarters, mm -hmm. keeping in mind that you are heading, you are leading Africa towards peace, towards integration, towards a bigger role in the world, towards democracy and towards very much inclusive, fast economic development. So can we just have that bridge with 2063 vision? And then the floor would be thrown open. Mm. Well, thank you, thank you, Bhatia. For a long time, <clears throat> the African continent has been grappling with the question of its development trajectory. And those of you that have been following Africa, you will recall uh, that at independence in the early 60s, there was a big question about how we were going to progress. And because of the politics of the time, we had some of us becoming. Uh, westward leaning <laughs> and others 
if we were gleaning. Yeah? And so they were socialists and they were capitalists and God knows what. And so the economic development trajectory somewhat became bifurcated from an ideological point of view. But even as it was being bifurcated, and because we had a framework of discussing this on an annual basis within the, Afri the Organization of African Union, the questions kept on coming. What would we do as an African continent? And the general consensus, although not written anywhere, was that let us first focus, and this was the big debate, do we focus on the economics or do we focus on the political independence? And the debate was, it might be difficult to focus on two, let us start with the political liberation. And that is why the OAU focused to a very large measure on the question of liberation. And it had a liberation committee, and there was the discussion around how do we take uh, the liberty, the liberation of uh, all countries of the African continent forward. And this came to the point of pushing against apartheid and, and the democratization of South Africa. As this was going on in the late 60s and 70s, the question then began, as we are achieving our independence, how do we pick up the economic side of things, you know? And of course, our economies were not performing very well. You remember the structural adjustment programs. You remember the discussions around the last decade. And I was telling the, the private sector earlier today, the difference between the trajectory of Africa and the Asian countries was one. When the World Bank and IMF came to us in the 70s, I said, you know, uh, we need a small government. You must disinvest in social services. You must uh, uh, cut down government investment in industry and blah, 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 blah. Africa took that advice. Most of the Southeast Asian countries did not. And that is where the difference started. That is where the difference started. By the time we finished the 80s, none of the African economies was functioning in any meaningful way. And so the debate began, what do we do to resuscitate and to get back on the path of growth and prosperity? From that point, discussions around the Lagos Plan of Action, discussions about creating regional organizations as blocks for economic development of the African continent. And it is that discussion that has moved to crystallize in Vision 2063. You know, I'm kind of cutting a very long story short. Hmm? So Vision 2063 is a blueprint that Africa has adopted towards a united, prosperous continent. You know, and so the discussions that have led to 63 and out of 63 are looking at a harmonization of policies, creating an environment that can allow for the, the, the joint growth and prosperity of the African continent. So we are looking at all sorts of things. Creating an enabling environment for, industry, for investment. So peace and security becomes an important, a very, very important segment of 63, of 2063. And part of creating that environment is creating a governance framework that is attractive, that is predictable, you know, that, that allows for, for participation of the citizens in their polity and, it, and, and hence their whole push for democratization. This year alone, a total of 18 African countries are going to go through the electoral process, you know. And if you look at the trajectory of elections, last year I think there were 16 or something like that, you will see there is more consistent elections, there is more competitive politics, there is more inclusion, there is more development of institutions and frameworks of governance that were very, very weak. So there is a thrust towards deepening the democratization process. So the, the environment, the, the, the creation of an enabling environment has become a critical part of 2063 because we believe you would have to create an environment that can allow for comfort of other partners to come in and invest in the wealth and prosperity of the African continent. And so we have a number of things, including peer review mechanisms, uh, where countries uh, get assessed, where uh, there is recommendation of how to improve what frameworks, judicial framework, administrative framework, legal framework, and so forth and so forth. So there's a whole set of enabling environment, creation of an enabling environment. But there is a whole set of programs that are supposed to facilitate the investment and growth. For example, the infrastructural programs, uh, 
that are going cross country, cross region, you know, uh, on the African continent. So we can begin to reduce the infrastructural gap, increase connectivity. You know, so we have Yamasukru, uh, which is a free, uh, is, what is it called? Free skies, you know, to allow for movement, you know, of, of, uh, of uh, flight and access so that you can push people, goods, and services across the continent. The idea within the 2063 and within the framework of the CFTA is that we can grow, for example, Africa's trade now, which is at about 15 to 17 percent, to about 25 percent in the next five to seven years. So there are some very ambitious programs, you know, that, that, that are supposed to be driven within the framework of 2063. Now, what is the link? All the things that I have said here this afternoon have the potential, if not money, to derail this vision. You know? If we do not, for example, have a, a good sense of how governance evolves, then it will become very difficult for the frameworks of governance to allow for growth of trade, even intra-Africa trade. If, for example, we have uh, the collapse of regional integration, if we have a, a very aggressive, like for example now, the American Africa policy says, uh, it, uh, America first, whatever that means, America first, uh -huh. now we are coming to Africa and you must give us the contract we want you to give us. Now this becomes a problem, doesn't it? So you, you're almost on a collision path. In, in, when, because our framework is an operative framework where you must answer to certain things. Are you bringing investment that is going to help us grow jobs? Are you going to bring us investment that is going to transfer technology? Are you going to bring us uh, uh, investment that is going to improve on beneficiation and the value chain? Now, if, if we have somebody else pushing in a, in, a, in a different direction, clearly it will have a direct impact on whether we can achieve 2063 or not. So there's a whole set of uh, a garment, it's really a blueprint, whose objective is to deliver a united, peaceful, prosperous African continent. Thank you very much. Thank you for your uh, lucidity and courage. Uh, okay, Nivedita, I'll give you the first chance. Thank you, Excellency. I'm Nivedita Lee, the Director of Research at the Council. Thank you, Your Excellency, for such an insightful uh, lecture. Uh, my question uh, is on uh, uh, you referred about the changing geopolitics and the kind of cooperation Africa the various countries are entering into. Uh, now we find Africa, it's not only the traditional powers that are engaged in Africa, and a lot of emerging powers, Asian powers are emerging. And uh, it is also creating a competition within Africa, rivalry uh, within Africa. Is this competition good for Africa? So I would like to hear. And coming to a little bit specific, uh, particularly relating to Kenya, though it is not a part of your lecture, which is my visitor to know about. The recent, we have heard a lot of uh, concerns being raised about China's uh, ARI project in Kenya. Uh, how, uh, you know, uh, true are these rumors, particularly relating to debt trap that Kenya will be entering into, uh, if at all uh, Kenya will not be able to pay uh, the loan? <coughs> Thank you. Some close tradition just introduced. Yes. Uh, I am Ashok B. Sharma. Mm. I am a journalist. My question is you talked about continental free trade area. How many countries in the continent are yet to ratify this? Mm. And could you specify the names of the countries and why they have not yet ratified? Okay. Yes. Thank you, sir. When you have uh, made a repeated uh, in reference to the rising crime rate nationally and internationally, mm. and then you have gone on to say the foreign external interference in the African continent. Uh, I see at the root of all is the natural resources and the future markets of the 
African continent. Mm -hmm. In the process, mm -hmm. the external forces forget all about the people of Africa. They are not taken into account at all. What they are looking for is the wealth, wealth of Africa, the present and the future wealth that is going to be generated in the process. Mm -hmm. Now, the you have also made a reference to the mutual cooperation. Mm -hmm. Right, ma'am? The about here I would like to say uh, the all the all that we are left the all the option that we are left with is we should create exemplary mutual cooperation strands. I mean, let's come to the Africa, I, I mean the, 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 the Kenya and India. If they become an example, like the South Africa, we have just signed a, 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 some uh, agreement a, a few days ago. Uh, likewise, if we have the agreements and mutual cooperation, exemplary co cooperation, that become an example for other nations over there, <coughs> maybe it will help the African people. Okay. So the people are in question. Thank you. I think we'll stop here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Let me begin uh, from the questions by the director of research. Um, two questions. Um, is there competition between the interest in Africa, traditional and new interests, uh, create, does it co create competition in Africa? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. But are we aware of this competition? Yes, we are. And part of the discussions within the African framework is basically to try and manage this. And so, what has happened is to begin to negotiate partnerships that are not offensive to the core principles of Agenda 2063. So a lot of the preparatory work that happens even before the Africa-India summit, for example, is now being done collectively to say, how is this useful and why should we, why should we make it even more useful? How can we shape it and things like that? We are doing that. We know the partnership, we are doing it with the FOCAC, we are doing it with TUCAT, and there's, some of them, there's a lot of negotiations that go into it. And, and we see that this needs to be deepened, so that there is a common understanding of the shared, of the shared challenges that we face, you know? There will be things that we will disagree on, even at a national level, that is not unusual for, for Africa. But I think overall, there is a consensus that we must do this thing collectively because when we act collectively, we have a better chance of achieving our objective as elaborated in that vision 2063. Now, China's uh, uh, SGR support uh, to Kenya and the debt strap. You know, uh, this question has become a question that we hear every year we go. You know, it is a question whether we are in Washington, D.C., or whether we are in New Delhi. Yeah? <laughs> now, the most interesting thing, and I'll be very frank with you on this matter, if you look at Kenya's debt portfolio, it is a very good mix of debt portfolio. We are very careful, believe me, because our macroeconomic framework is very well managed. I think it is one of the best managed macroeconomic frameworks that you have on the continent. And it has been steady and robust, not for one year, not for two, for decades. We've gotten to the point where we can actually absorb political shock without necessarily impacting negatively on the private sector. And we are very proud about that. Now, this question of the debt trap, if you want me to, to tell you what we think it is, there is a combination of several things. And the first one is the fear of the US, of China. And we think that there is a deliberate propagandist, and I'm not, talking, I'm not saying propaganda in a flippant way. I'm saying it in terms of what the facts are. If you look at the facts in terms of the, the percentage of our debt, you know, to our national uh, GDP, there is nothing to worry anybody. We are not worried at all. So we do not have any possibility of a debt trap or failure to service our debt. But we think that one way in which the American propaganda about Africa being gripped by China is to basically throw this debt trap story around. I think it is one of those things. Now, why we are asked why are you doing business with China? China is, uh, you know, is, is uh, corrupt. You know, and you Africans are also corrupt. You know, and now we are doing that. So, you know, you are not, you are being reckless. They are throwing money at you. 
The one thing that I need to say here, and I think I, I will also say it almost as a, as a criticism to China, uh, to India, is that there is no country that knows Kenya, that knows Africa better than India. In fact, historically, India has a fast mover advantage. But India somewhat remains hesitant to take advantage of the fast mover advantage. China is meeting Africa at the point of need. At the point of need. And it is interesting to watch even the contracting, which has changed significantly in terms of its efficiency and efficacy. Now, if a Chinese uh, company gets a contract awarded today, the Exim of Bank of China releases the money tomorrow. And they do that thing. They do whatever project it is immediately. So they don't have to worry about, you know, give us a guarantee, give us comfort this, give us this. So I think the structuring of the support for companies is crucial. Because as I have indicated, Africa is facing an infrastructural deficit that we must deal with if we are going to get the promise of the CFTA and the promise of the prosperity that is offered by our own continent in terms of our natural resources and other resources. But we cannot sit down and give you letters of comfort, you know, American company or I don't know, French company and things like that because we don't have the money in the first place. We don't have the money. But the Chinese government has structured itself in such a way that it is able to support its companies to execute. And when we went to Washington, this President Kenyatta actually told uh, President Trump, why don't you give your company support? Why don't you give them comfort? Why don't you? Because they have to be able to, to the environment of, of contracting has shifted internationally. And we are going to have to play into this game. And I think it's the same message I need here. It is important that the Chinese, uh, the Indian Exim Bank, finds a way to support India's companies in order that they can execute in a timely and efficient manner. If it doesn't happen that way, you will lose in the game. You will lose in the game. And I think this is very important too. So there is no death, the, uh, death trap <laughs> in Kenya. We are unlikely to have a crisis of not servicing our debt anytime soon. Because I don't, we are paying very close attention to that and we will not let it happen. Now the CFTA. The CFTA is probably one of the most uh, 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 ascribed to agreement on the African uh, land, uh, on the African continent. When we signed on the CFTA last year, uh, February, 44 countries signed on that day on the CFTA. Today, 52 countries have signed on the CFTA. In the African uh, situation, we use 15 signatures to enter into, uh, into force. But because we needed a higher threshold, because it was important in our interpretation that we have a broad-based ownership of what we considered a very important agreement, the heads of state decided that we would push this ratification threshold to 22. To 22. As at February of this year, we had 19 ratifications. So we are looking for three ratifications. I believe that we are going to get those three before two. So we are really at the cusp of the CFTA taking off. So th those are the figures, and, and we are very comfortable in terms of how we are going. Um, I agree. Um, Africa, Africa has been endowed with natural resources. Sometimes some people, some analysts think this is a curse. You know, I'm sure you have read a lot of literature on the, on the curse of the African continent, you know. Congo certainly, 60 years old Congo has never known any peace because of this wealth and everybody wants their hand is in the cookie jar, you know. Um, so it is true and, and I think it is not lost on the African continent that there are interests that would wish to continue or to create a relationship that is nothing but extractive. But we are saying no. This is not going to continue being an extractive relationship. It has to be a relationship that leaves benefits with the African people themselves. And this is the discussion. And this is beginning to frame even the contracting culture 
that we are having. And, and that is why uh, you, you now find that countries are talking more from a regional perspective, creating regional standards of negotiation. We are having situations where countries are getting people from other countries to help negotiate together. And I think this is an area that India can be very useful in terms of what you are calling the mucho, the exemplary mucho cooperation. Yeah. I think it can go even to the questions about negotiation. How do you negotiate a good contract that brings value rather than takes away the, the resources of the continent? Thank you. And, uh, <clears throat> let me compliment you for making us thirstier the more you speak and then you can be here. And I don't think we'll be blaming your team for having taken me over and breaking your home with this. My question would be very simple. As the economic side and international cooperation imposes itself on us, and then we, for the last two or three years, we hear the Instead of political wars, we hear more of economic wars. And then including the war, which is now the Afghan its war, to Americans remove it all these advantages for in this process. My question is, the, does this American policy and new, I wouldn't say economic order, because it's, it fits some and it doesn't fit others. Mm -hmm. Does it represent with the Brexit at the same time? Because there is a complete change Mm. In, the, in the geostrategic and also both in Europe and in America, the values are for your part. And it seems that the people of the South, like our continent, Africa, like Asia, are re reminding the world of the certain minimum mm. level of distance, I would call it. Mm. Because they are, in fact, going back to distance. When you see either you do this or you don't do this, mm. it's become like a cowboy manner of speaking. But do the American policy and then also the Brexit represent a challenge or an opportunity for the Africans? For the Africans, because it's very important how, you see, for me, very good, and then we don't lack great leaders in Africa. But you, the, the idea is how to change or to reverse the challenges and opportunities. From your own perspective, being a far sighted person, how could you see this? Thank you. Yes, Jeff. S.S. Bakri, founder director of the Institute of Human and Industrial Studies. So, your fancy you have made a detecting analysis of the current and cross currents issues discussing in the world in the world politics. And in passing, you also made a reference to the role of the of the United Nations as to what it should be. Mm. My question is, uh, of late, do you think of late, the UN has become a weak and ineffectual engine, beating in the wild its luminous wings in vain, if we see its history of the last 20 to 30 years in nutshell? I think mm. Africa used to have a rowing trade in the world in 1950 mm. to the tune of 13% share in the world trade. Today it has been reduced to, I don't know, maybe 3% or 4%. So what is the future of African trade in the world in the not too distant future? Mm. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I have three questions to you. Yeah, Nujata, very for the benefit of the analysis. Uh, first, uh, you talked about Indian Ocean. India's vision of uh, Indian Ocean is one which is cooperative, inclusive, which uh, uh, is, uh, as you talked about, it a rule-based order which promotes uh, cooperation and uh, security and economic growth. So what is your take on that? Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, uh, you mentioned uh, the, uh, the Agenda 2063. One of the uh, initiatives under that was silencing guns in Africa by 2020. Mm -hmm. 
how far have we moved on that? Uh, and, and third, both India and uh, Kenya share this uh, challenge of terrorism. Mm -hmm. During Prime Minister Modi's last visit, mm -hmm. there was a talk of formalizing mm -hmm. this into some kind of an agreement. Mm -hmm. How far have we progressed? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, all right. I think we have already got three questions. So yes. Might be to answer. We'll have one final round. We'll mm -hmm. take care of both. Of you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Again, some very insightful uh, questions. Let me attend to them. Is the growing nationalism a challenge or an opportunity? You know, for Africa. I think there are two views, and then I'm not going back to the academic side. <laughs> Um, one, one view is that when, because America has become so inward looking, it offers the opportunity of not interfering with other regions. It's not paying too close attention. And you have seen a number of cases like that. Some of us that were looking at the DR Congo election were a bit surprised, you know, at the Facility of, of the American policy making machine, given the interest that we know, and so forth. So that, that that is a good thing because it provides the policy space to chart a different trajectory. Now, if you take this view, I think the imperative then is to really chart that different trajectory, you know, and uh, to do so quickly. Because I don't think uh, that position of America, frankly, will be like that for a very long time. This, this is my projection. Because it, it, it is uh, in a state that it can't be like that for a long time. I think there will be really an implosion of one kind or the other. So I think time is of essence. Those who take this view must, must focus on, on the time. There are those who then say, you know, we have had a stable international order that is somewhat uh, superintended by the Western, you know, the Western norms and values and leadership and so forth and so forth. And that in fact, the flux we are seeing now is because this has shifted and there is not an alternative view. And that is why it is okay to have another power emerge quickly so that it can create this superintendence. You know, that is the second view. Now, I think to, to this one, my, 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 my sense is, we, we, I think we are going to see a flash for a little bit more. It's going to take some time. Why? Because the ages upon which, the fulcrum upon which this world order uh, was based cannot be reconstituted without the changes that we are seeing in other places. For example, I do not think that there is going to be a rescinding of China to the point where it was going to be number two. I, I, don't, I don't think that is going to happen. I don't think you can expect that the changes within the Indian subcontinent will recede. And I don't think that the changes that are taking place in the African continent are going to recede. So I think there's going to be a, 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 period, a period of flux, which is why I was saying we need to reflect, those of us that are stepping up to this game, how do we want to shape this in a way that brings out some outcomes that are desirable and aligned to our own visioning of tomorrow's world, not today's world. Because I think it will be quite tragic if we move from one superpower to another superpower. I think it will be quite tragic, frankly. You know, but this is my view and sometimes I am accused of being a little bit tragic. But I think it will be quite tragic if we are shoot from one end to the other end. I think we have a space to shape the dynamics of the world, whether they're going to be multipolar, whether the cooperation is going to take a different type of a shape. I think it is important that we do not get ourselves to a point where we allow for hegemonic tendencies that we cannot control for. You know, And I think the interests, whether it's commercial interests, whether it is the upcoming interests of the African continent cannot be taken for granted. You know? Not a very good answer, but I think that is a good As the UN become weak and ineffectual, as many people in the UN bureaucracy will tell you, the UN will be as strong as the member states. If you have a situation where the member states are saying, I don't care about who based this, 
and I'm not going to pay you until you do this for me. Clearly, that is what is weakening the UN. And I think part of that is because the norms around which the UN was built are becoming contested norms. Norms around multilateralism, norms around solidarity, norms around common humanity are being contested by some of the people who advanced these norms as the primary norms to define the UN. I think that's part of the problem. Now, to my mind, what, what, what that has done is that we have a situation where now, in fact, the UN has uh, outsourced the difficult challenges of the world to the weaker members. Just look at peacekeeping. So the big boys don't do boots on the ground. It is left for the weaker countries. You know, they're the ones who can, you know, you bring your boys and girls, we will pay you a thousand or whatever it is, we pay. You know, it has become peacekeeping for cheap. And, and it's very interesting. Question of climate change. Climate change, the weaker ones who are suffering the biggest <laughs> effect of bad behavior of this bigger one are the ones left to carry the burden. So it has completely inverted the sense of burden sharing. It has completely in, uh, uh, inverted the, the principle of mutual accountability. It has completely inverted the sense of our common humanity. And I think this is what is making the UN as a multilateral institution so weak. And that is why, in my view, the debate on the reform must be robust. It must be completely robust. We cannot continue having a global governance system that is so skewed, that is so irrelevant in terms of the reality on the ground, that is actually apportioning responsibilities in such a skewed manner. So I think the debate, the rea this reality means we have to engage in the UN reform debate much more robustly, you know, much more vigorously, and we must demand for it as a matter of right, as a matter of aligning the reality on the ground with the, our own institution that we call the United Nations. Now, the future of African trade, it has shrunk over time. The discussions that brought us to the CFTA were precisely these discussions. I think it has become more apparent to all 55 of us that we are weaker if we remain individual. And that we are going to get stronger if we can create a united economic bloc. And I think the CFT is going to give us that opportunity to begin to negotiate as an economic bloc, as a serious economic bloc, really. But we are talking of a population 1.2 billion, we are talking about the range of minerals and resources that are on the African continent, and we are talking about the possibilities that it offers. So I think the CFTA is the platform that is going to respond to the, to the quantum of trade and investment that is required and that Africa can offer to the rest of the world. So I, I think uh, we remain very hopeful. You know, it is going to take some time. Why? Because colonialism, the reality of colonialism divided Africa in a very precarious way. So we have Africans that are Lusophone, we have some that are French, some that are British, and some that are Arab and God knows what else. Now, I think the challenge that we are going to have is how we create platforms that begin to harmonize this. This will take time, but I think that journey has started and I think it is irreversible. Um, Indian Ocean Rim, we have to strengthen the Indian Ocean Way. You know, there's a way in which when you think about the frameworks of cooperation, the strong ones, the Indian Ocean Green is not the first one to jump to your mind. So I, I think we, we have to appreciate the totality of the scope of work that we need to do in the Indian, in the Indian Ocean, because it's not just defense. It's the economic activities there, there are commercial activities there, there is security activities there, there is transnational crime. The portfolio of work that requires to happen means we really need to build, in my view, the Indian Ocean Group more seriously and more purposefully, so that it can become the vehicle that helps us to manage this and that entire reign that is providing for us both opportunities but that can actually throw a task, risks that can very quickly reverse any gains that we may have had so far. Uh, silencing the guns 
It is true that we have had the silence in Vietnam's uh, aspiration for 2020. It is true a lot of work has, ha has gone into it, but it is also true that we are still struggling with this. Now the challenge with silencing the guns and aspiration for this is that we deal, and this is deliberate because it's very difficult to deal with the other side, we are dealing with the receiving side of the guns. You know, there are very few African countries that have more industries. Actually, other than South Africa, I don't know another one, you know. But the discussion around the war industry needs to go beyond Africa to the entire demand and supply chain. And we have to find a way of pushing obligation on the supply side too. You know? It is one thing to collect and to demobilize guns. It's another if they are moving in every day. You know? So I, and I think that it requires to, it has to be a discussion that is beyond the African continent to also deal with the, with the, with the def not defense, I'm sorry, the arms industry. Because there's a lot of arms that find their way into the African continent. This is generally a challenge in terms of just this question on silencing the guns. But that is not to say there is not a lot that is happening and quite some significant progress has been achieved so far. Then terrorism. Uh, uh, it is true that there has been discussions. It is also true, I know, that our intelligence uh, arms are in constant contact, you know. Um, it would be useful for this to be formalized, you know, and I think it is one of the areas that we'll be discussing, even if it's not tomorrow, just to make sure that uh, uh, this is given traction. The reason for this is because terrorism, first of all, not, knows no boundaries. And in fact, they have become so agile in terms of working across boundaries. So it, it would not be useful for states to continue depending on their territorial integrity argument where it comes to terrorism. I think history and experience has shown us that we can only counter terrorism with more cooperation, with more interaction, with more interoperability across territories. Thank you very much. Uh, I know that the minister is running out of time, uh, but there is one last uh, round, so I'll go to all there's the some students. There's some yeah. students, yeah. yeah. One, two, three, and that will be the end. Yeah. Go ahead. Short uh, question. My name is Tanchi. I'm from Diplomatist Magazine. I am from Diplomatist Magazine. Uh, Excellency, would you like to shed some light on Big Four? I'm not talking about Africa's Big Five. Yeah. I'm talking about mm -hmm. Big Four. Launched in shape by the government of Kenya, and uh, how, in your opinion, India can collaborate with Kenya in this aspect? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good afternoon, ma'am. I'm just a political science student from Delhi University. So, ma'am, as you mentioned, that China comes to Africa only when in need. So does Kenya support China's One Belt OBOR initiative? And how can India and Kenya deal with the growing Chinese influence in the Indian Ocean together? Okay, the last question. Hello, ma'am. Thank you for providing your insights. My question to you is... Uh, uh, my name is Vijayan from uh, Rangas College Delhi University. Mm -hmm. okay. My question to you is, as you mentioned and we are witnessing today a new world order of unipolarity and US hegemony. So how do you think the world and so far specifically Africa and India should overcome this hegemony and move towards a multipolar world? Thank you. Mm. Thank you very much. Again, some very good questions from the students there. Um, the, let me begin with the big four. It's, it's the easier one. <laughs> the, the big four, basically, is the, 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 is the, um, the, how shall I put it? the way we summarize President Kenyatta's vision of his last uh, term. Um, and this big four, it's called the big four agenda, crystallizes is programmatic thinking in terms of the areas that he wishes to pursue in terms of pushing us in our development trajectory. So what are the big four? The big four including, include universal health care, 
and the universal health care right from preventing all the way to diagnostics, all the way to the production, the pharmaceutical lines, and, and so forth and so forth. And this is driven by the reality that our maternal child health care has been improving since independence. And so the question has been, what do you do with the rest of the population, the ambulances, the young adults, adults, and the aged citizens? So this has been the big issue. And it also includes the whole area of uh, insurance, health insurance, so that we can have universal health coverage of every Kenyan in our territory. So that is universal health care, again, in a very summarized kind of way. Second one is uh, uh, affordable housing. Like many developing countries, Kenya has had a lot of movement from rural to urban you know, migration. And we all know that rural to urban migration creates sometimes unplanned dwellings and, and you know, and uh, substandard really housing. And the idea here is to provide a scheme that allows for access to affordable housing, particularly to the low-income population, because those are the ones likely to end up in the fringes of, of the urban centers. Now, the important thing here is that, in fact, we found that even from the development uh, uh, access to services, these areas in the peri-urban areas are the most lacking and the most vulnerable. So if you look at uh, gaps, even in vaccination, it is a mother who is uh, in a peri-urban area, who is a single mother, who has to uh, take three jobs to survive, that is likely not to submit her child for vaccination. Because she simply just doesn't have the time to take the child to hospital, you know? So these areas have become pockets of vulnerability. And we think part of the way of answering that is to provide the basic shelter that begins to have a trigger-own positive effect on the general economic development and productivity of the population. The third area is food security. Food security, because I was talking about the context of uh, fragility in the region. Although as a country we have gotten to a point where we can manage our food security, the problem is that we are sitting in a region that is ecologically very fragile and sometimes even of conflict. And so when there is cyclic famine and drought, the demand for food of necessity takes away from our stock. And so there is a big discussion about how do we grow our productivity, you know, in this environment so that we can stop prior, even for the region. You know, so we are thinking in terms of both quantum, but also in terms of the, the quality, the quality of the food that we grow. And so here, the investment portfolio, even for Indian companies in terms of agricultural technology, know-how, in terms of production, in terms of growing the, the right crop, uh, the right seed, the right technology, whether it is irrigation or anything like that, provides the opportunity for investment in this regard. Then the fourth of the big four is manufacturing. You know, we have identified a number of sectors like leather, like textile, which are labor intensive so that they can respond to the need to create jobs. You know, again, an area where there is opportunity for investment by Indian companies, agro processing and, and things like that. So these are the big four in a very short way. And we can provide, if you are interested, you can talk to one of the colleagues here. We can actually provide documents that you might wish to reference. Do we believe, uh, do we support, I think it was, do we believe or do we support uh, the Belt and Road Initiative? We support any initiative that would help us to close the infrastructural gap in Africa. And so in the discussions we've been having with the Chinese, we are saying, the Belt and Road Initiative requires to take cognizance of the African uh, infrastructural plan of the continent. So, and that, those are the discussions. So the, the 60B that uh, uh, President uh, Xi Jinping unveiled in the last uh, FOCAC summit, the discussions on infrastructure are being pushed towards aligning that development with the African plan of action in terms of infrastructural development. 
Um, finally, there was the question about Africa. I didn't get that one. What was the last question again? US. US. US, US hegemony. Uh, in India and Africa heading towards cooperating to reach multipolarity. Yes, aha. Uh -huh. India and Africa cooperating. I, I think that's the only way, frankly. You know, when I sit down and look at the world today, I think, I think history is offering us a unique opportunity to shape the geopolitics of the world. And the question then becomes, are we ready for that opportunity? Are we ready for that opportunity? Or are we just going to sit and, and, and do an analysis of how the world was with America and how the world might be with China? I think we have to be proactive and just determine and shape the multipolarity that we think will answer to our own aspirations and interests. Thank you. Thank you very much. So just you may wish to add a line or two on what happens after the successful holding by Kenya of the Sustainable Blue Economy Conference, which is probably one of the biggest global events that Kenya hosted very recently. I think that it is, you're correct, Batia. Um, when we started the organization of the Blue, the Sustainable Blue Economy Conference, we did not anticipate the outcome of that conference. And I think what made it such a success was the fact that we were able to convene across, across sectors, across ministries, across the societal sectors. And it was interesting to see the discussions across all these places, whether it was in the academia or science, you know, the debate on what, what is the science of the green economy, the debate among us, the private sector, and what are the opportunities for investment, the debate of uh, sea facing cities, of mayors, you know, talking about what do you do in terms of uh, creating sustainable environment in the cities that are sea facing, whether it was ministers of environment, whether it was ministers of water and fisheries, whether it was ministers of infrastructure. I think this was the value of this meeting. For the first time, we had a convergence of <coughs> delegations from 184 countries in Nairobi drawn from a cross sector of governments that were talking together. So it was a meeting where we did not just have ourselves, you know, diplomats, now we are talking the same thing, rule based this, rule based that. So we are all combated. I think the conversation was enriched by the fact of diversity and the passion that everybody brought to the table. Now one of the outcomes, the critical outcomes, are people in defense and security, you know, talking what do we do with maritime security to secure the potential of, of the economic potential and commercial viability of seas and waters and rivers and lakes and so forth. And I think it, it was this multipolarity of it that gave it the richness of it. Now, if you look at the outcome documents, and because as we were talking, people were actually making deals. Uh, corporations were being signed. You know, from that discussion, we've had a lot of discussions around how do we stand our own cost guard, you know? Uh, so the benefit of that conference is be has begun to manifest itself. We've been having a conversation with Seychelles about how do we float blue bonds? How do we float blue bonds that help us to conserve the, the ecology in the sea, you know, as part of environmental sustainability? So I think there is a lot there that people can pull out and actually give traction in terms of cooperation. A lot of projects, a lot of ideas, and a lot of possibilities, you know, that would create cooperation. Final point about the Sustainable Blue Economy Conference. One of the things that struck me most was the fact of its non-controversial nature. For the first time, there are people saying, listen, we have a big problem here. And this problem is not going to be solved by each one of us individually. In other words, in that conference, people were actually talking strengthening multilateralism. For me, it was a most fascinating way of coming back to how can you strengthen multilateralism. Maybe one way of doing it is to step into non-controversial issues and actually work around how you build solidarity and cooperation and alliances on a matter that is impacting all of us in equal, in equal measure. So it, it, it was a, an eye-opening meeting. It has been referenced significantly across the globe, and it is forming the foundation for a lot of discussions around oceans, 
and bring the economy moving forward. So we hope we can use it as a foundation as we continue the preparations for the UN Ocean Conference in 2020. Thank you very much, Minister. I want to assure you that uh, this is one domain in which uh, uh, India is uh, doing some very serious thinking and reflection. And I think uh, at the national level, Indian business and industry as well as the Indian government are uh, showing a great deal of interest in various uh, aspects and dimensions of the economy. Mm -hmm. And I think this should really be considered as a major subject uh, on the bilateral agenda mm -hmm. for India-Kenya cooperation. Mm -hmm. Dear friends, as you have noted, we have uh, an extraordinary foreign minister with a very strong scholarly background who also uh, clearly is very used to speaking on television and that is why <laughs> she picks up your questions, catches the essence and replies to them in a succinct form and that is the reason why she could answer as many questions Madam, as you did today covering uh, all uh, uh, parts of the audience and giving complete uh, satisfaction to all the curiosity. Uh, I would like to say that uh, the message that came out from you clearly was that the world is changing uh, in various uh, layers at various levels. It could uh, create more problems for us but also it has the potential to help us to create the opportunities. I think that was the promising and optimistic message you gave. You spoke very frankly about the geopolitical realities where on the one hand you went out flat to defend whatever China is doing in Africa and yet in the same breath in utter honesty you also said that the worst thing that can happen to the world is to move from one uh, unipolarity to another unipolarity and that I think the strategic convergence between India and Kenya I think our both countries want a multipolar Asia, a multipolar Africa, and indeed a multipolar world. This is where uh, a world where all of us can grow together. By all means, uh, competition is fine, even rivalry is fine. What is need to be avoided is the conflict, and I think that is where, through uh, stepped up cooperation, we can achieve a great deal. I must say, finally, I was a little concerned about uh, your very frank comments about uh, the Exim Bank of India. It is one of our primary very successful institutions. It does reflect, I must say, a certain conservative way to finance. Uh, you know, if Chinese can write the check tomorrow to Indian companies, sorry, Chinese companies, probably we are not in that league. But this is not to say that Exim Bank is not extending, in fact it is extending huge amounts of money to Africa but it does it somewhat conservatively and pragmatically and I think that the point that comes through very clearly and I hope the two high commissioners are listening, I think there is a need for Kenyan authorities to sit down and have a frank chat with the Exim Bank privately and see how whatever the problems there, there may be it could not be resolved. Mm. I think uh, on behalf of all of us, we want to uh, express our very deep appreciation to you. Dear friends, you have noted, Africa is changing and it is changing very fast. Uh, the problem is, is with our mindset. I think our mindset must also change to be able to understand and interpret Africa. I think that is the central message that comes out from yet another very successful and stimulating a uh, cerebral event that ICAW has laid out for you. So thank you very much, Madam, and may I request you to join to applaud Madam.